It's a tough song right there. Do you think about the words of that song? No matter what I may lose, I choose the refiner's fire. Now, most Christians aren't that way. Most Christians, they lose anything. They're mad at God. But he said, no matter what I may lose, I choose the refiner's fire. Whoo, man. That's tough. That's deep right there now. Turn to Leviticus chapter 10. <clears throat> Leviticus chapter 10. Leviticus chapter 10, we'll begin reading in verse 1. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said unto Aaron, This is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. And Moses called Mishael and Elzaphan, the sons of Uzziel, the uncle of Aaron, and said unto them, Come near, carry your brethren from before the sanctuary out of the camp. So they went near and carried them in their coats out of the camp, as Moses had said. And Moses said unto Aaron, and unto Eleazar, and unto Ithamar, his sons, Uncover not your heads, neither rend your clothes, lest ye die, and lest wrath come upon all the people. But let your brethren, the whole house of Israel, bewail the burning which the Lord hath kindled. And ye shall not go out from the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. For the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. And they did according to the word of Moses. And the Lord spake unto Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee, when ye go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. And that ye may put difference between holy and unholy, and between unclean and clean, and that ye may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken unto them by the hand of Moses. I want to talk to you about Aaron and his family tonight. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. And I plead tonight for the filling of the Holy Spirit of God. Please deal with our hearts. Teach us some timeless biblical truths that will help us not only in our own individual lives, but in our families as well that we'd be the people you'd have us to be for your glory. And Father, we'll thank you for what you do in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. It may surprise you to find out how many times you find Aaron's name mentioned in the Scripture. As a matter of fact, you'll find it 319 times in 303 verses. Of those 319 times, 138 of those times, it is in the same verse with the mention of Moses. Aaron is definitely a key individual, especially in the first five books of the Bible, but those are not the only times that his name is mentioned. If you were to look at Aaron's resume, I mean, after all, he is the high priest. He is called to be the mouthpiece for Moses because you remember that Moses, when he tried to get out of the call of God, said that he was slow of speech. So he said, all right, I'll have your brother then do the talking. But he was the mouthpiece of Moses during those great miracles when they went into Pharaoh and challenged Pharaoh to let God's people go. Aaron saw great miracles from God and had a part in the deliverance of the message. Aaron was one of those who slew a lamb for the, sla for the saving of his firstborn. You realize his firstborn came out of Egypt because he slew the lamb. Not only that, he crossed through the Red Sea with Israel. Just the thought of that is absolutely awesome. Going through the Red Sea with the water high and lifted up on either side, walking across on dry ground with the Egyptian army held off behind. And then when they got across, the Egyptian army allowed to go through and God drowned them all in the midst of the sea. What an awesome miracle to even contemplate. Not only that, he stood when people talked of stoning Moses and Aaron. Aaron did not turn and run. He stood there. Not only that, he was made high priest over the people. Unfortunately, though, he had a part in perverting the worship of Jehovah God in chapter 32 and didn't seem to understand what all the fuss was about 
when Moses came down the mount and broke the Ten Commandments all at one time. He followed God's instruction for the building of the tabernacle. Some 15 times it says that the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron. He is also one of those who got to go into the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle. What a wonderful yet fearful time that must have been to walk into the holy place. In the passage that we read, his children offered strange fire on the altar and God killed them. And then God told him to do an amazing thing. Don't mourn for your children. Don't mourn. Israel will bewail them, but you don't mourn. God had something he was teaching not only Aaron, but teaching the children of Israel as well. And I believe teaching every parent. By the way, later, his son Eliezer became high priest after Aaron stepped off the scene. So let's notice some things about Aaron tonight that I believe we could learn some lessons that could help us. Number one, notice his call. Go over to Exodus chapter 4, and we'll begin reading in verse 14. Exodus chapter 4 and verse 14. Now, in Exodus chapter 4, of course, we have the story of the burning bush with Moses. And notice as they get into the, as Moses gets into the conversation with the Lord, it says in verse 14, And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well, and also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee. And when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. And thou shalt speak unto him, and put words in his mouth, and I will be thy mouth, and with his mouth, and will teach you what ye shall do. And he shall be thy spokesman unto the people. And he shall be, even he shall be to thee instead of a mouth, but thou shalt be to him instead of God. You might underline that last phrase. That's an awesome phrase. A responsibility that Aaron was going to have. Now remember, they'd come from the same parents. They were brother. As a matter of fact, he was older than Moses. So at the time of his call, it's more than likely he already had children. And no doubt the children were probably grown by this time as well. Now some might think that it's strange that God would call uh, Moses over Aaron. After all, Aaron's the older one. And Aaron is the one who had, I don't want to say a slick tongue, but he was the one who could talk. But God calls Moses over Aaron. Moses is shy. Aaron seems to be bold. Moses at the beginning is very reticent, but Aaron is outspoken. Moses halts in utterance, but Aaron is a man of eloquence. Moses is meek and prone to wait, but it seems that Aaron is impetuous. You see, it seems like he had the spirit of tending to rush into action. And God puts him subservient to Moses. I mean, this is a call that would jeopardize his own life. You know, I think of missionaries of the past. We read the missionary stories, how they went to places and their lives were in peril much of the time. And today we try to keep our missionaries as much away from peril as possible. But the truth is, the service of the Lord may bring peril. That does not take away the call of God. It does not take away our responsibility to obey God. So this call jeopardized his life and the lives of his own family members. After all, we see two of his family die in the passage that we read. Earlier on, we see Pharaoh having the power to destroy them. This was a call to be second fiddle, and it was the toughest call of all. Now, how many here have a younger brother? Raise your hand. You have a younger brother. Now, imagine the Lord saying to you, I'm calling you to serve under your younger brother. And in your eyes, your younger brother is to be as God to you. Now, think about that for a moment. Now, I am a younger brother, but I have a younger brother too. That'd be a tough thing to do, wouldn't it? That would take a real spirit of submission. Now, some of you fellas think about that. You think, wow, boy, that is, that'd be tough. That'd be hard. Well, now you get an idea what your wife has to go through. 
For she is to be submissive to you in how many things? In all things. I dare say that she has the hardest job in the marriage. Because she knows you. I mean, if anybody knew, I, you know, don't you wonder sometimes what Aaron, what little terms he used to refer to his brother? You wonder, did he ever use any of those terms to get him to fight, you know, when they were little? And you don't forget those terms even when you're 80 years old. They're still used at family gatherings. <laughs> and he says, not only am I calling Aaron to be a servant here, but Aaron is to look at you as though you're God. And how is the wife to look at her husband as though he's who? Jesus. Was Aaron, was Moses perfect? No. But that didn't change the fact that his responsibility was he was to serve under Moses. We know nothing of Aaron's wife. We don't have any idea what she perhaps was like, although she did have a part in raising a future high priest as well, as well as being the wife to one. So it's a tough call to someone who is imperfect himself, will have to take all orders from an, a younger brother and to serve a younger brother that if anybody knows his younger brother's foibles, it would be Aaron. And yet he is commanded to do that. So we see his call. Secondly, we notice his commitment. Turn to Exodus chapter 4. We'll look at a number of different verses. Exodus chapter 4, verse 29. It says, And Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel, and Aaron spake all the words which the Lord had spoken unto Moses. Now you think about that. He's the one doing the talking, but he needs to look at Moses as though he's God. The people here... Aaron doing the talking and he has to do it in such a way that it is Moses who is recognized as the leader. Go over to chapter 5 verse 1. Afterwards Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. Go over to chapter 7 and verse 1. It says, And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a God to Pharaoh. And Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Look at verse 2. Thou shalt speak all that I command thee, and Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh, that he send the children of Israel out of the land. Go down to verse 6. In Mo, uh, verse six. And Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded them, so did they. Go down to verse 10. And Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh, and before his servants, and it became a serpent. You go down to verse 20. And Moses and Aaron did so as the Lord commanded. And he lifted up the rod and smote the waters that were in the river in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants. And all the waters that were in the river were turned to blood. Go over to chapter 11 and look at verse 10. Chapter 11, verse 10. And Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh. And the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart so that he would not let the children of Israel go out of his land. Go over to chapter 12 and look at verses 1 and 2. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Notice God is speaking to both of them. Go over to chapter 12, verses 30 and 31. Scripture says, And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt. And there was not a house where there was not one dead. And he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise up and get you forth from among my people, both ye and the children of Israel, and go serve the Lord as ye have said. So Aaron obeys his call. He follows Moses' lead. He spoke the words of Moses when commanded. Matter of fact, over in chapter 17, you remember after they get uh, across the Red Sea and they end up doing battle with the Amalekites, 
we find that when Moses was up there praying, lifting up his hands, and his hands were heavy, when his hands would come down, the Amalekites would begin to defeat Israel. He'd put them back up, and the Israelites would start winning. And it was Aaron and Hur that came up and held up Moses' arms. So he even aided his brother in prayer. You see, Aaron has quite a history of commitment. And what's interesting about this, he has no Bible to read yet. Do you understand that? He has no Bible to read. But he is committed to the command of God. I mean, after all, the first message that came to him, it seems almost would have come from Moses. This is what God has said. But he's being obedient to that call. He understood something that few do today about God's plan and God's expectation. God expects us to be obedient to the God of heaven in our relationship to other people. Obviously, this morning when we had the number of veterans that came forward, every one of you veterans understand what it is to be under authority. You understand something about that. And I dare say that most of you at one time or another in your career served under people that weren't as smart as you. But that did not release you from the responsibility of following their lead. You understand something about that that a lot of Americans don't understand. That unfortunately a lot of wives in the home and a lot of children in the home don't understand. Of course there are a lot of children that only think they're smarter than their parents. They only think that. They're not. And unfortunately, some, because they never learn, will learn some of life's lessons the hard way. The question comes, are you committed to God and are you committed to the word of our God? So this is what God says to do. This is what we will be. You know, it's God who set up the church. It says he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And yet there are people who claim to be saved today who won't even put themselves under the protection and authority of a local church. There are even some in Christian circles who believe that church is a nuisance and not even a necessary one. There are some who have said, and they write books about it, how the church is the greatest danger to the home. Brother, the church is the greatest protection for the home that God's given. As long as you have things in their proper place, where God put them. There are people here, you've been called to different things. God didn't call everyone to be a missionary or an evangelist or a pastor. He doesn't make everyone a teacher in the church. There is a gift of teaching. That's not given to everybody. It's like the rest of the gifts. But are you committed to what God has given you to do? There are some people who ought to be using their voices to sing. Instead of just wasting it sitting in the pew. Ought to be using what God's given you. Instead of just wasting it. I got news for you, you're not getting any younger. There's some people who have no business in the choir. There's some people if they did sing a special, it would be special. But you ought to do what God's called you to do. Just let God use you. We can look back and look at people in our church who are now in heaven. They've gone on to glory, and they just let God use them. I, boy, I think, when I think of people like that, I think of Ray Berry. What a man. Obviously, he would never have sung in the choir. And he never would have sung a special. He wasn't uh, the best talker in the world, but he taught the Bible Institute, and he had a heart for what he was teaching, not just for those he was teaching. He had a heart for the job that God gave him to do. He was also our treasurer for a number of years. That took a lot of work, a lot of time, faithful. Are you committed to use what God has given you for the glory of God? Do you have that kind of a commitment? Aaron got the call of God and he seemed committed to it. He did it. Back in 1974, God called me to preach. He called me to preach the Word of God. 
I'm committed to preaching. I mean, I've been doing that for so long. 1974, God called me to preach. That's been 35 years ago. Man, that's a lifetime right there, just about, it seems like. So what are you going to do when you retire? Don't plan on retiring. I plan on just preaching. As long as God gives me a voice. I remember W.H. Quisenberry. That's Brother Joe Logan's grandfather. I remember Brother Quisenberry getting up at a preacher's fellowship, and he, he was preaching up in uh, Shelbyville, Tennessee. And he said, God's called me to preach. He, he was in his 80s when he died. He was preaching up till he died. And he said, I'm just going to preach till I die. And then he said, some of you say, but what if you have a stroke and can't preach? He said, I'll just ask God to take me home. And they said, but then you say, but what if God doesn't take you home? I said, I believe God answers prayer. Amen. Just preach. Brother, I've learned sign language if I couldn't do that. It's preaching sign language. But just be faithful to what God's called you to do. I mean, the truth is, who are any of us to even have the privilege of serving the God of heaven? I mean in anything, who are any of us? If you take a look at what God uses, just keep your hand here and go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Here's the qualification for serving God. This is what God's looking for. Notice beginning in verse 25, he says, Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and the base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and the things which are not to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in His presence. Do you remember why God made Saul the king of Israel? It was not because he was head and shoulders above every man. He made him king when he was little in his own eyes. And when he got big in his own eyes, God took the kingdom from him. Yeah, we're not much, and we're only here for a little while. And then, brother, we're gone. The important thing is what we do for the time that we are here. Are you committed to what God's given you to do? Listen, if you've got a voice where you can sing, you ought to use it till you can't sing anymore. Use it to be a blessing. Some people have solo voices. Some people have choir voices. You understand what I'm saying? Now, I do believe you've got a solo voice. You'll be singing in the choir too, for that matter. But there are some people, they're not solo voices, but they sure do fill in the choir. And I don't just mean with good looks. It just sounds good. They ought to do it. We have, and throughout the years, our vacation Bible school. People that give themselves... It's, we've had successful Babel, uh, vacation Bible school. Not because we have a bunch of talented people, but because we have people simply surrendered to do God's will. That's what it takes. We're not exceptionally talented. But surrender. We'll see God do great and mighty things. We're not in this only as long as we're treated right. Because the truth is, you serve God, the devil's going to see to it that you're mistreated from time to time. Sometimes, it's like when David said to Asahel, when Shimei was cursing him. And Asahel said, let me go over and take off that dead dog's head. He said, what if God told Shimei to curse David? Should I kill him because he's obeying God? That's an amazing thing to me. It's like David saying, you know, maybe God said I needed a cussing. So he had Shimei cuss me. You know, sometimes people do us wrong because we're getting the big head. And those people don't know it. Now, Shimei had to answer for what he did to God. He had to answer to God for that. But nevertheless, David understood an important principle. If you're going to serve God, God can do different things to keep us whittled down to size so he can still use us. You look at Paul. Paul had written parts of the Bible. And he tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 that God had sent a messenger of Satan to buffet him. 
Because of the abundance of revelations, it would be easy for him to get puffed up. But if he got puffed up, God wouldn't be able to use him anymore. He understood the biblical principle that God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Yeah, people do you wrong. That's part of life. By the way, if you attended the bars, people do you wrong there. You go to Walmart, they'd still overcharge you once in a while. I don't care where you go. Somebody, it's impossible but what offenses will come. Going to quit the first time that you're offended? Second time you're offended? Third time you're offended? Not Aaron, buddy. He was committed to the call that God gave him. Now that doesn't mean, by the way, that you always make the right decisions. Don't you wish every decision was just plain, easy to make? It seems to be fairly easy till you start dealing with people, and then suddenly it's not so easy. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Where you've got a clear Bible verse that says, when this happens, do that, and when that happens, do that, that's pretty clear. That doesn't make it easy, but that's really clear. But how can you tell what God is doing in another individual's life when you don't know everything? That's a little more difficult. Job's three friends had a problem. They understood some scriptural principles. They simply misapplied them to the wrong guy. And there may be somebody going through a hard time and you're thinking, yeah, they deserve it. You know, like Job's three friends. You don't have a clue what God's doing. They might be God's champion. You didn't even know it. But can you go through life and always make the right decision? Can you raise kids and always make the right decision? You know, when I hear somebody say, you know, I've been around 70 years. I wouldn't change any decisions I've made. I'm thinking either he's got Alzheimer's and doesn't remember some of the decisions he made. Or he is a fool. Yes, there are decisions I would have changed. We say, I'm just so afraid of making a mistake. Well, I understand that. Let me give you some promises that I've claimed over and over again. Psalm 37, verses 23 and 24, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Now get this, Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. If you're seeking to serve God, you're seeking to do right, that is the desire of your heart. You may make a decision that's a wrong decision. Even though you fall, you'll not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholdeth you with his hand. So he had the call and he was committed to the call. Notice his courage. Go to chapter 16. Look in verse 2. It says, And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Verse 6. And Moses and Aaron said unto all the children of Israel, That even then ye shall know that the Lord hath brought you out of the land of Egypt. Then in verse 9. It says, And Moses spake unto Aaron, saying unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he hath heard your murmuring. Now go over to chapter 14. There he stood with Moses, though badly outnumbered, obviously. In Numbers chapter 14, you have another situation that's very similar. Let me begin reading in verse 1. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night, and all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in this wilderness? You talk about having everybody against you. Let me ask you. The great vast majority here said Moses and Aaron were wrong. Was the majority right? No. You know, that's why it's so silly. Somebody comes in from another church and they want to complain about the other church they went to. Don't even listen to it. Because you don't have a clue if you're hearing the truth or not. And you listen to that kind of garbage. I, I remember Brother Jim Rowland, bless his heart, up in Tullahoma, Tennessee. He had a group from another church come in one morning. Might have been an evening service. I don't remember which. I mean, there, it was like 40 people came in from another church. I mean, obviously... When you've got 40 people that you've not seen before suddenly in on a service, you know something's up. And going around just talking to a few of them, he found out what church they were from. 
And he got up in the pulpit that morning in front of everybody. He said, now, folks, just want you to know we've got some folks here from so-and-so Baptist Church. He said, I want you folks to know that you're welcome, but don't bring your dirty laundry here. We don't want it. Amen. Now, I got news for you. You know, people can disagree with me. I might be wrong. They might be wrong. God knows which is which. Better be praying for one another because we're going to stand before the one who knows exactly who's right and wrong. But just, you know, somebody comes, well, there's a, cra- there's a bunch of us who say, was that supposed to sway somebody? That might, work, that might work with your representative, but why should it work with the man of God? What does that say at the Lord? What does the Bible say? Because God's right about everything. So this man showed some courage. I mean, they were talking about stoning him. He had showed courage up against, standing against Pharaoh. Man, at that point, you realize that Pharaoh was the king of the mightiest nation on planet Earth. And he stood against him. He had courage in standing against the rebellious people of God. Have you ever heard somebody say, you know, you think you're a leader, but look around, nobody's following? I got news for you. Leaders lead even when nobody's following. This idea that I got to have a crowd around me, behind me to be a leader. Leadership is not decided by the moment. As a matter of fact, many a leader, practically every great leader has had to have a time when they were alone. It's one of the things I like about the biography of Winston Churchill. You talk about a man. Now, I know you look at those pictures of Winston Churchill, he just like, looked like a hunched over bulldog is what he looked like. But I want to tell you, that man was a man. He stood against the Nazis when everybody in England made fun of him. Everybody. He, went, he was in political exile in his own country. If the people wanted a funny quote to laugh at the mock, they'd go to Winston Churchill because they thought it was funny. It wasn't so funny, though, when the Germans were bombing their cities. They found that Chamberlain and the others had sold them down the river. Then they wanted someone to bail them out. Guess who they chose? The leader who was willing to stand alone. And he got them out of it. Now, I'm not interested in raising a bunch of kids that only go with the crowd and does what the crowd wants. We want to raise up some young people that will stand for God even if they stand alone. That's the kind of leader God's looking for. Now, here's Aaron. Boy, we see some courage in this man. We don't find Aaron striking back at this people. We find him simply obeying God. I read a story earlier today. It was entitled, A Life for a Leg. Now, I understand for some reason, even a lot of... We understand the world looking down at those people who go in march in front of the abortion clinics and try try to hold up signs to talk people out of murdering their babies. And some of you would say, Preacher, I I can never do that. And by the way, and I thank the Lord for those who go to choose life and all that. Some of man, I could never do that. But it takes courage to do that. You know, realize how they're cursed and mocked, and there are people seeking for them just to step out of the way just a little bit so they can put them in jail. All to save a life that they may never know anything about to stand for what they believe in. Well, this story I read today, it took place just a little while back. George Crail of Cherry Hill, New Jersey, had worked abortion clinics, as had his wife Tina, for 20 years, begging potential killers to change their mind. Last month, he was at the, and this is probably two months ago now, he was at the South Jersey Women's Center when a young man was taking his wife or girlfriend, whichever, to the clinic, And the man hit George as he was planning to give them literature when they approached their car. I mean, he hit George with his car on purpose. The impact was so violent, it crushed and twisted George's leg and broke several of his ribs. So George was taken to a nearby Camden Cooper Hospital where he had surgery. Meanwhile, back at the abortion clinic, his wife Tina was able to talk to the young man who ran down her husband telling him that she forgave him and that she knew that her husband would forgive him too. In fact, she told him that George would want him to know that if his broken, twisted leg would save their child, he'd gladly do it over again. 
And then she said, making him look directly into her eyes, you should know that God has something in store mighty for you, and you should take this as a sign from God. And the young man replied, I know, I know. And then she embraced both the woman and the man, telling them to think about the child that they were thinking about killing. And adding, this is how important this child is. The couple then got back into their car and drove off without going into the clinic. A leg for a life. A leg for a life. Planned Parenthood would hate this guy and want him in jail. I'm talking about this fellow who stood out in front trying to keep people from murdering their babies. Other people say, well, it's just some crackpot. I call him a hero. Amen. He saved a baby. At great cost to him. Probably never walked the same again. Courage. One of the things, two of the things we're missing today in our country is character and courage. To simply stand for what's right. Aaron had that. But after saying all those good things about Aaron, nobody's perfect. We also see his crimes. What do you mean? Exodus chapter 32. Talking about his spiritual crime. Notice verse 1, it says, When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden ear earrings, which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters. Bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings, which were in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early in the morrow and offered burnt offerings, brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Look at verse 7. And the Lord said unto Moses, Get now, go, get thee down, for thy people which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted thyselves. And then he goes and tells Moses he's willing to put them aside, destroy all of them, and make a mighty nation out of Moses. Aaron, here's the high priest. Here's the man left behind. Here's the man who's in charge of the worship of God for God's people. They simply come to him and they said, we don't know what's happened to Moses. Make us gods. That was his time to say, have you already forgotten God speaking out of the mount? Have you already forgotten what God said? Have you already forgotten the miracles that God did? But Aaron didn't respond like that. He was swayed. Now we saw Aaron was a good man. Aaron had put his life on the line and will put his life on the line again. But boy, does he fail miserably here. Now, I know there's some folks, they'd write him off for good now. He's done. He's messed up. There's no, I knew he'd always do that. I knew he's a phony. I knew he's a fake. I knew there's nothing good about him. I got news for you. There are an awful lot of heroes, of fundamental Bible-believing Baptists, that a lot of so-called fundamental Bible-believing Baptists run down today. And those heroes were men that had they not stood, there probably wouldn't even be an independent Baptist church in America today. Some of you have been around for a while, like Brother Borff, understand that. You say, well, I believe they're wrong there. And where are you wrong at? Do we write you off too? What do you do? Just continue to follow God and thank God for other people who have followed Him. Jude 3 says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. Aaron should have stood. Now, he didn't have a lot of the Word of God, but he had heard God speak from the mount too. He knew that it was wrong to make this calf, and yet he made it. He did wrong. Titus chapter 1, verses 9 to 11 says, Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able to, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped to subvert whole houses, teaching things that they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. There are a lot of false teachers out there today. You saw that in the Sunday school lesson this morning. 
the emerging church crowd. There's a lot out there who will tell you, listen, this isn't that important, just back off. It's more important that people feel comfortable. You realize that is as old as Cain, who didn't like the restriction of bringing a blood sacrifice to God. As a result, his sacrifice was not acceptable. There's an awful lot of vain worship going on in our nation today, and we are commanded to stand for truth. But here's Aaron. He didn't keep his charge. He did what seemed right to him for the moment in spite of what God said. No wonder by the time you get to Leviticus chapter 10, you think this might be the fruit? This might be the reaping from what he sowed in chapter 32 when his two oldest boys take a strange fire and put it on the altar? After all, fire's fire, isn't it? Fire's fire! Looked the same, didn't it? We're still worshiping God, but a strange fire. Yeah. It's not what God commanded. He loses two of his children over that. Ah, but that's not the only place where Aaron messed up. Go over to Numbers chapter 12. Yeah, we have a number of great things to say about Aaron, and we ought to. He's to be commended in each of those areas. But you get to chapter 12 and verse 1, and it says, And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. Let me ask you a question. When did God speak by Miriam? That should have been a clue right there to Aaron, man. You're on the wrong side here. But suddenly, because his wife wasn't what they thought the pastor's wife ought to be. Therefore, it's all right to speak against him. But you notice the last part of verse 2, and the Lord heard it. Uh-oh. We know that's trouble, don't we? The Lord heard it. As a result, judgment comes. His sister, by the way, ends up getting leprosy. Go over to chapter 20. Look at verse 10. Doesn't that rain sound good tonight? And so far, no tornado sirens going off. When that happened a few weeks ago, I knew, you know, I said about 10, 15 minutes to go in the message, but I knew it was over. I was just making noise after that. Because nobody's mind was on what I was saying that night after that happened. Isn't that right? But where was I going to send you? Out into the storm? That would have been dumb. Just stay here and trust God. Okay, you found Numbers chapter 20. Look at verse 10. Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation before the rock. And he said unto them, Here now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And notice verse 12. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron... Because ye believe me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. Oh, no, he messed up with Miriam. Now he's messing up with Moses. Man, he was right in following Moses all the way until right here. Paul said, follow me, even as I also follow Christ. Fellowship is not a blind fellowship here. It's not a matter of just a simple disagreement. Well, I think you ought to do it this way. I think you ought to do it that way. This is a clear disobedience of God. And not only does Moses lose the privilege of going into the promised land, Aaron loses it as well. So with all those good things we said about him, uh, he's to be folded too, isn't he? Aaron messed up. You ever messed up? You ever disobeyed the Lord? You ever, after you did it, say, what on earth was I thinking? I knew better than that. And obviously, God didn't kill you yet because you're still here. Well, notice his commendation, chapter 33 of Numbers, verse 1. Numbers 33 and verse 1. These are the journeys of the children of Israel, which went forth out of the land of Egypt with their armies under the hand of Moses and Aaron. You go over, to, you don't need to turn there, but First Chronicles 23 and verse 13. 
the sons of Amram, Aaron and Moses, and Aaron was separated that he should sanctify the most holy things, he and his sons forever, to burn incense before the Lord, to minister unto him, and to bless in his name forever. I had a special job for Aaron. Not perfect. Have you ever heard somebody say, well, God can't use a crooked stick. It's all he's got to use. That is not an excuse for wrongdoing. But I want you to understand something. If God didn't use crooked sticks, none of us would have a chance. Because none of us are always perfect or always right. Psalm 106 and verse 16. I love this verse. It's a powerful verse. It says, They envied Moses also in the camp, and Aaron, now get this, the saint of the Lord. Wow, what a title. The saint of the Lord. That's God's commendation for man that he wouldn't let go into the promised land. Now, you could read Numbers 20 and 28 and 26 and verse 1. By the way, in those verses, we find that he had a son that followed in his footsteps. Now, he lost two sons, but he had a son that followed in his footsteps. It would been nice to have four out of four serve the Lord instead of only two out of four. You go a little bit later on to Eli. Eli had two sons, and although they were both in religious work, they were both wicked and ungodly, and God killed both of them. Why does two sons fail? I believe they learned something bad from daddy when he made the wrong choice. Man, that's why it's important, parents, that we always seek our best to do right. One of the things I learned from Aaron in this, I better teach my kids right. I better teach my children right. I better teach them a proper respect for the things of God. I better teach them a proper respect for the church of Jesus Christ. I better teach them a proper respect for the service of God. Doing what God says. To whom much is given, much shall be required. Somebody turn that thing off. Thank you. So much hangs in the balance. We reap what we sow, and usually we reap it in our children. I've said this often. There's, well, there's a few things I don't much care for about pastoring, but that's not the issue. God called me to, be, called me to preach, and he's put me in a pastor for a long time. But there's one thing I hate about being a pastor. I think the missionaries here will understand this. Any pastor here will understand this. I cannot make a mistake without hurting others. I hate that. Now, you know, I noticing Dr. Morgan back there. If I was a doctor, I wouldn't want to make a mistake, but usually you can just go and cut around it and sew it back up. <laughs> <laughs> or... Or they bury their mistakes, one of the two. (laughs) But I can't make a mistake without hurting somebody. And they never quite look at things the same, it seems like, after that. And that's something I hate living with, Brother Moore. Aaron made some mistakes. Now, God commends him. He even later on called him the saint of the Lord. That's awesome. But, you know, thank God even when you make a mistake, even when you hurt other folks that you didn't intend to hurt. Thank God there's forgiveness in him. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I think some who could be great Sunday school teachers or teachers in VBS never become one because they're afraid they won't do it just right. Just surrender and let God take care of that. Let him do it. Some tremendous lessons here in the life of Aaron. Some tremendous successes. And yes, tremendous failures. And why did God put that there? Why does he record each of these things in his life? Because according to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that we would not do after the same things that he did that were wrong to warn us today. And we've got a complete Bible. 
He didn't have that. To whom much is given, much shall be required. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Dear God, deal with our hearts tonight. Deal with us in the matter of surrender. Deal with us, I pray, in the matter of service. Deal with us, I pray, in the matter of our commitment. Lord, if there's one here without Jesus Christ as Savior, I pray they come to the Savior tonight. May they trust the one who died for them on Calvary's cross, was buried and rose three days later from the dead. May they come to him tonight as their only hope for salvation. But God, I pray for believers tonight. They'll get some things nailed down in their lives about serving you in whatever area you open up for them. But God, making their life count for you and being faithful to it, showing courage and commitment in that which they do. And Father, we'll thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.